On Tech News Today, we've got the new Reddit rules, plus Uber changes its app to insult the mayor of New York. And you're not going to believe the latest Apple patent. We're talking to journalists from Mashable, Politico, Newsweek, and Business Insider. So stick around. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, July 17th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace. It connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. And by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. With one simple integration, you can offer your customers every way to pay. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. And our co-anchor today is Mashable Senior Tech Correspondent, Christina Warren. How are you doing, Christina? I'm great. I'm great, especially because of what day it is. Yes, what day is it? I'll let you say it. If you can do it without <laughs> words, that'd be great. All right, so it is... Perfect. National and World Emoji Day. Yeah, so yeah. that was me doing the world and then, yeah, emojis. It was just a smile. So, yeah, no, it's it's, it's World Emoji Day, which is awesome. Um, emoji is really kind of the language of our times. It is kind of the pigeon of modern of modernity. And uh, I know a lot of people um, talk about it with derision. Uh, but as I've said on this program and on other Twit programs many times, I guarantee you that there will be Buffy the Vampire Slayer-like levels of um, academic papers and <laughs> thesi about emoji just seriously like check out the stack the next couple of years it's going to be buffy levels of academic these of, 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 uh, of like a study on this topic buffy levels Buffy levels. And the reason I say that is because Buffy the Vampire Slayer has an inordinate, and, and frankly, it's a great show, but frankly, it's disproportionate to the, the, the goodness of the show and how long it lasted of academic papers and, and theses that are dedicated to studying it from a cultural standpoint. It's it's a little bit mismatched. I mean, like the, the amount of academic content about that show is truly mind boggling. Uh, Chicken Ed in the chat room says that uh, uh, they're feeling a little emotional, uh, emotional <laughs> right now. Getting emotional. It's good. Yeah. That's good. Wow, that is weird. Also, uh, there's a, something interesting happening at 11 a.m. Pacific today, which is yes. that Tesla is announcing something. Do you have any predictions about what they're going to talk about? Well, you know, at first we were thinking that it was going to be the Model X, which is the SUV that yep. they've been uh, supposed to come out with for forever. Uh, but as some people on the Tesla forums were pointing out, you know, a Friday afternoon news drop doesn't seem likely. It also is going to be an audio conference and not a uh, regular um uh, you know, big, big event. So now what we're thinking that is, is that it's going to be a software update for the Model S and it'll be improving the autopilot feature. So that's oh. kind of, it's not quite their self-driving feature, but it's the autopilot feature that will help take over, you know, in the event that, that something's going wrong and the car can, you know, maybe help, you know, do the parking and that sort of thing. So just kind of an extension of the, of the, the stuff they've rolled out earlier this year. That's, well, that's what we're thinking now. Well, no matter what, uh, Elon Musk himself is going to be doing the announcement and he's like the new Steve Jobs everybody wants to see him present now exactly although you know he doesn't he's he's a little uh, there's not a way I can say this that is not completely offensive so I'm not going to but he doesn't have the charisma of a Steve Jobs but he is the figurehead like a Steve Jobs um in, in fact in some cases more so since he has rockets and stuff too so he said <laughs> you know model S announcement today and then there will be a rocket announcement uh press conference on Monday so for all you Musk followers out there it's it's uh, a BFD and so so be sure to be tuned in you know at two o'clock yeah he's got rockets Jeff Bezos has rock everybody's got rockets these days it's got rockets drones yeah. you know uh, self-driving cars or at least autopiloting cars everybody's got everything it's here's what it is we for for years you know the, the basis for iron man was supposed to be like larry ellison right and then people kind of retconned it and they're like oh no iron man is really elon musk here's what it really is everybody is really iron man yeah everybody's iron man all iron that's mm -hmm. right. Doors that go like this are nothing these days. you got to have a space program. Well, let's jump into the news. As expected, Reddit CEO Steve Huffman yesterday did a Reddit AMA to talk about new restrictions on speech 
for the network, Christina Warren. Uh, this is uh, probably less than a lot of people were expecting, certainly less than what I was expecting. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the new rules and policies are for Reddit? So there's not a whole lot that's different. I mean, basically, he's saying that one of the big things he does say is that they need to actually codify having some actual policies and having some actual content policies, because until now, it's kind of been amorphous. And some of the things will kind of uh, depend on, he quoted the Supreme Court, you know, um, their, their decision on what constitutes pornography. I'll know it when I see it. Um, but basically, they're going to kind of have a differentiation where they're not going to accept things that um, are promoting illegal activity. Um, you can talk about illegal activity in terms of like, if you want to talk about drug use, but you can't promote like where to buy drugs. Um, there's going to be, you know, a banning on people who are threatening violence and harassment towards others. And um, they're going to be classifying in a way that's not really uh, clear now, some of these um, more hateful communities so that they have kind of an NSFW type of filter so that they won't be immediately visible or findable um, by uh, regular people. So hardcore racist uh, uh, subreddits of which there are several or many, many uh, will be a considered adult content. To me, the, the trickiest thing is the uh, the actual rule for the violence part of it is any kind of speech that incites violence. So right. that is up to interpretation. And this is the problem with uh, with social sites like Twitter or like Reddit, where they, they have staff who are essentially, essentially making these judgments. So for example, if you said everybody should go beat up, you know, um, ugly people or something like that. That would be a clear case of, you know, inciting violence. If you said, I had a dream last night where I thought, had this thought, is that inciting violence? Or if you say, I support the war in Afghanistan, is that inciting violence? I mean, it's really open it to interpretation. It really is. And I think that, it, that that's why, you know, uh, Steve was basically saying, A, they need to kind of get these things written down and, and try to codify some of these policies. B, uh, he didn't say this, but I think it's clear that there's going to be definitely a learning period and, and, and a curve of what is and what is not allowed. He tried to stress that nothing was really going to change. The difference is that there were some subreddits for, for instance, you know, um, r slash raping women. That will be banned. Uh, but, uh, you know, C-Town, everybody's terrible, favorite, terrible, hateful, you know, place, will continue to exist. So um, I, it, it's going to be a weird balance. I have a feeling, you know, on, on speaking out against war and political issues, I have a feeling that sort of thing would be protected, as in most cases it is, saying I, I, I'm against the war or I support war. Uh, but, uh, you know, when it comes to actual threats, I think is when is when they're, they're, they're getting into uh, or, or actual, you know, claims of I'm going to do this that, that that's when it um, will probably cross the line. But again, this also, you know, you have to understand that a lot of these communities will be adherent, will have to adhere to these policies, but how is Reddit actually going to go about monitoring this stuff? That's not really clear. And I think in most cases, a lot of stuff, I think it's safe to say, will probably be able to fly under the radar and will have to be alerted to staff, will have to be, you know, um, uh, reported. Um, so I think it's possible that there, there's some people who might be able to skirt around the rules simply because their subreddit might be small enough and only incite a, a small enough group of people um, that, that it might not, you know, uh, I guess, arouse suspicion, so to speak, of the people who have the, the, the abilities to ban stuff. Yeah, I have a theory about, about all this. And, you know, I think that Reddit comes out of the world of sort of the Usenet, which had a really, you know, anything goes kind of a, uh, a feeling, but it was it was not a big deal because these it, it, Usenet felt private. It felt like when you were in one of these little subcategories, nobody was really paying attention. Nobody really cared. It was it was it was kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Reddit, on the other hand, has actually become something of a brand uh, over time. Very slowly, it, it has become this, and it also has categories that have names. I think it's the names of the cat like there all this kind of horrible speech pops up everywhere in in, in comments. It, it can pop up anywhere. You look at. YouTube comments. It's awful. But the, you know, these are categorized. It's premeditated abuse and, and hate speech. Um, you know, there, there are subreddits like, you know, hurting, are hurting animals, <laughs> you know, are, are, you know, much worse. I'm looking at a whole yeah. list here that, that I, most of which I, I can't bring myself to say, but you know, they're the categorized, these category, categories, and then people go wandering into the dark corners of, the, of Reddit, uh, expecting to see this, you know, mainstream, well-known brand, and they run across these these premeditated uh, conversations, uh, and that I think what, what what is what drives people nuts. But still, I th I think it's uh, I think it's good that they did something. I, you know, it, I, I'm not really sure uh, how to feel. Uh, you know, how I feel about this, uh, other than to say that it's a pickle that they're in. Lots of social sites are in the same 
uh, boat, although Reddit is a little bit unique. So. Yeah, no, I think that's that's fair. And I think one of the things that I've kind of commented on on another podcast that you called Rocket um, in the last couple of weeks. Oh, so you have a Rocket too. I do. I do. Have, I, I, I'm also um, a, a Iron Man. Um, no, um, but as a, you know, I think that one of the big challenges that Reddit faces that some other communities and some other places haven't as much is that they've been entrenched in a certain way and a, a certain mind share for the last decade. And now they're trying to, you know, kind of right the ship, so to speak. And, and it's coming after, you know, you have a, a core group of users who've gotten used to the way things are for a certain period of time. And I think no matter what changes you make and no matter how valid and necessary those changes are going to be, there's going to be backlash inevitably from the community simply because it took so long for those changes, which uh, frankly are, are necessary. But uh, I mean, I think we could argue, and, and I, I, I more than argue, I think you, we can definitively say a lot of these changes are, are a long time coming, and a lot of these brands, as, as you put it, you know, um, exist in kind of different ways. But um, I think that finally making these sorts of changes, um, it has been, it, it, it took too long, and because it took so long, it, uh, it's, it, the fallout from these changes, I think, is going to be worse than it would have been had they pulled the Band-Aid off a couple of years ago. Well, we got some more news for you coming right up, but first I want to talk about Prosper. Prosper is America's very first peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace. It's a hot category now because Prosper started the category uh, a few years ago. It enables people to invest in each other. It's financially and socially rewarding. You can borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days and use the money for just about anything you want. You can get a, a car loan, a small business loan, a special occasions loan, there are lots of different types of loans you can get, but one of the best ones is a debt consolidation loan. Debt consolidation is a really, really good idea. Uh, so don't rack up more debt on your credit cards. Just pay them off with a Prosper loan. They have more than 2 million members. They've facilitated uh, more than $4 billion in loans. And um, now for a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers and listeners a $50 Visa gift card with your new low interest loan. You can get up to $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. Just go to prosper.com slash twit for this special offer, which is just for the twit audience. We want to thank Prosper for supporting Tech News Today. Well, the UK High Court struck down that country's controversial surveillance law today. David Myers, tech policy reporter for Politico Europe, and joins us now to talk about it from his beautiful patio, I guess. David, how are you doing? Look at this. I'm good. Wow, it's fine. very I'm nice. Happy. Isn't that wonderful? He looks like he looks like the house from Ex Machina. Is it Machina or yes, Machina? Like, whatever it is. Yeah, beautiful garden. <laughs> anyway, David. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today. Now, the Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act, or DRIPA, was emergency legislation. What was the emergency, and what what would the law have changed? Sure. Well, it was based on, on a Europe-wide directive which said that all countries had to force their ISPs to store uh, communications data for between 6 and 24 months. Um, it's a bit similar to what was going on in the U.S. that Edward Snowden uncovered, the very first Snowden revelation about the Verizon call records, except um, in Europe it was simply uh, out of the open. Um, so what happened was last year in April, the uh, European Court of Justice, or rather the Court of Justice of the European Union, struck down this uh, EU-wide directive um, uh, on privacy and data protection grounds. And so uh, that was the emergency as far as the UK was concerned. Uh, they, they were implementing this in national law. They were forcing ISPs to store all this data. Uh, and bear in mind, this isn't the, the contents of, de of communications. This is details of who called who and when or, you know, who, who was, uh, you know, uh, contacting people uh, online. Um, and, uh, yeah, that legal basis was taken away. So they suddenly, three months uh, after that happened, they brought in uh, very, very quickly uh, a new law, a primary legislation uh, called the Data Retention Investigatory Powers Act. Uh, and, and they introduced it. Uh, they had like one day of debate in Parliament and then they just rushed it into law. It was a, a week between its introduction and it becoming law. So wow. it was it was it was rushed. And I think that's yeah. the problem here. So, so is that why it was struck down? Why do you think that why do you think it was struck down? Well, because it failed the same legal tests as the Europe-wide directive. Uh, essentially, well, uh, the Europe-wide directive, there were other problems with it as, as, as well. But the core problem, sorry sorry for the shaking there, uh, the core problem was that uh, it, there were basically poor safeguards 
on uh, who could access the data. And in the UK, uh, with uh, what happened today was that the court said, right, there's, there's two main problems with this law as it's written, uh, which is uh, one of them is that uh, it's not just being accessed for serious crime, it's been accessed for a wide range of investigations. And secondly, there's no real, there's no judicial or independent oversight over who gets to access it. Now, uh, you, uh, you had mentioned that they have, I think, nine months to rewrite the law and try again. Uh, oh. That should be no problem considering how quickly they did it the first time around. Now, the <laughs> ruling today was actually groundbreaking. Can you talk about what was unique about this entire situation? Sure. It was the first time that a domestic court struck down primary legislation in the UK. And it was also the first time that members of parliament uh, successfully uh, got a judicial review against uh, legislation passed by the government and the two members of parliament here one of the, uh, from opposite sides of the spectrum one of them is labor a guy called tom watson uh, and david davis from the conservative party uh, both of them uh, big civil liberty liberties advocates for for many years um and they uh, you know they they went against their own parties uh, on this one uh, so it was it was uh, well, one thing that was very interesting though was that uh, they were the ones who actually asked for this nine month delay so you've got this well they didn't ask for nine months they said, please give the government until the end of the year um, to, uh, to, to come up with an alternative. Um, and, and the court said, well, let's stretch that out till March. Um, uh, so you've got this rather strange situation in the UK now where a law that has been declared unlawful is still uh, applied. And it's going to be applied for um, up to nine months, depending on how fast uh, the government comes up with uh, a revision. To, to, to theoretically make it legal. Uh, the question is, can they actually do that uh, without still, you know, breaking the same European fundamental rights uh, to privacy and to data protection that this law breaks? Do you think that they will? Um, I think it's difficult to do that. Uh, one of the key problems and, and something that this, uh, this ruling didn't actually address uh, is that uh, these laws are indiscriminate. Uh, the, this is blanket data retention. They, they're not targeted towards uh, particular individuals or, or anything like that. They're simply collecting the communications data of everybody. Uh, and that in itself is illegal under the EU fundamental, uh, under fundamental rights, uh, the European uh, uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. And uh, I, I, I suspect that there may be a challenge of what comes up. Uh, don't forget that the, uh, the Conservative government that's in power now was previously uh, in a coalition with the Liberal Democrats who stopped them from bringing in even more draconian surveillance powers. And since the Conservatives got in on their own in the last election, they're promising that they are going to bring in this uh, so-called Snoopers Charter. Uh, and uh, that is likely to happen within the next uh, couple of months. Mm. David, are you still in Berlin? I am, yeah. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on this late in the day for you. Uh, it looks like you have a beautiful, uh, very green environment there. Like It looks like you're in the Berlin Biodome or something like that. <laughs> uh, David Myers at Politico.eu, and he's the one and only Superglaze on Twitter. Thank you once again, David, for coming on Tech News today. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, Uber is fighting the city government of New York in multiple ways and now has even changed its app to fight City Hall. Polly Mossens is a reporter for Newsweek and joins us now to talk about this. Welcome to the show, Polly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Now, how did Uber change its app to slam the city government? So you can actually order a de Blasio. Um, so you have, you know, your regular options. You can get an Uber Pool, an Uber X, an Uber T in New York, which is our taxi service, or you can order a de Blasio. If you try to do that, it'll bring you to put, like it's a little petition page, just a little screen where it says, we have a problem with the regulations. We don't think this legislation is good for Uber. Sign our petition here. And, um, and basically, um, they, uh, what, can you explain, I guess, the conflict? What, 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 what are they petitioning against? Why are they angry with de Blasio? Yeah, so the conflict here is really all about this piece of legislation that Council Member Rodriguez proposed. There's been the study done that showed that there's 23,000 more for hire vehicles on the roads in New York. Not a lot of people drive in New York, so adding 23,000 cars is a huge impact to our traffic. The Department of Transportation found that speeds are actually down over one mile an hour. That's 9%. So it's really causing a lot of congestion. There's noise issues. There's air quality issues and just quality of life issues. So city council decided the logical thing to do is to cap how many for hire vehicles are on the road. 
If they do that though, that means that you're effectively capping how fast Uber can grow. Obviously, Uber has an issue with that, but city council thinks that this legislation is necessary because the people of New York deserve better air quality, less congestion, and less of these four higher vehicles on the road. And for an idea of how many cars 23,000 is, that's double the yellow taxi fleet. That is a lot of four higher vehicles. Yeah, it really is a lot. Now, Uber is uh, pulling out all the stops to, uh, to oppose the, uh, the city, uh, including uh, running a TV commercial in the city. Can you tell us about their TV commercial? Yeah, their TV commercial really stems on the point that it's all about the driver. That if this legislation passes, it's really going to negatively affect the drivers. They won't be able to make a living because there's less cars that are on the road. It'll take them longer to connect with the customer. The argument is that if they can't keep adding more cars, they can't serve their customer base. So the customer will have to wait longer. The driver will receive less rides and then make less money. So they're making an economic argument. But the city is saying that, you know, we have to regulate the market to some degree. We can't just let Uber regulate itself over time. And the city's perspective on this is, yeah, Yes, it might stop how much the drivers are earning a little bit, but it's not going to bankrupt them. And there are other four higher vehicle options that they could take. A lot of these people, if they're accredited to drive an Uber, they are theoretically accredited to drive a yellow cab. So the city is looking at it as, you know, Uber's making this argument all about the, the economy, you know, just like the money, the economics, and this big, very expensive TKME commercial is supposed to prove that, but the city really disagrees with it. So de Blasio actually has a history of kind of going against um, these uh, yellow cab alternatives. You know, he famously was against the the, the, the green taxi program and, and expanding that beyond the boroughs. Um, what do you think? Uh, so do you see any of the, I guess, other than the yellow cabs uh, who obviously are going to be in favor of this? Do you see Uber maybe gaining any allies from other proponents of increasing the ability to get, uh, you know, uh, uh, cars for hire to other parts of the city? Because obviously it's not a problem in Manhattan, but I think you know, as someone who lives in Brooklyn, Uber is frankly one of the only ways I can get a cab or get a car um, at, at certain locations. Um, e even the green uh, cars aren't really available. Do you think there's any possibility that they would be able to partner with some of the groups that have been um, criticizing the mayor and his past stances on expanding the, the, the uh, borough taxi programs? Christina, I think that's a really good point. And logically speaking, you'd assume that these groups would join forces. And perhaps if it gets bad enough, they will join forces. But the politics are so strong. And these rival companies, even if it's for hire vehicle versus for hire vehicle, they fight each other. At these city council meetings, there are grown men screaming at one another with their respective lobbyists. So the politics here are so strong that even though it really would benefit New Yorkers and Queens, you know, in Inwood and Washington Heights, even in parts of the financial district, Manhattan, where you don't get as many of these yellow cabs, just getting past those politics would be so, so difficult for these New York, you know, these New York lobbyists, and these New York companies that unfortunately, while I think it's an opportunity for them to work together, I don't know if it's realistic for them to get past the politics and work together. Unbelievable. Well, New York, what a uh, what a city. <laughs> <laughs> Polly Mossens is at Newsweek.com and you can follow her on Twitter at Polly. Thank you so much for joining us today, Polly. Thank you. All right. Well, Apple filed a patent today that suggests a new e-commerce system that chooses advertising based on how much money you have to spend. <laughs> Jim Edwards is the founding editor of Business Insider UK and joins us to explain this bizarre patent. Welcome to you, Jim Edwards. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And, and you're in London, is that correct? Yes. Well, I want to thank you for coming on late as well, so I appreciate that. Now, how will Apple know how much money you have to spend? Uh, it's a pretty ingenious system, judging by the patent. Uh, basically, it um, the your phone is hooked up to your credit card, either through Apple Pay or your iTunes account, and uh, it essentially examines the balance of your credit uh, on your credit card or on your uh, debit card, and um, depending on how much money is in your account, it uh, shows you ads uh, of things you can afford. And it, it doesn't show you ads of things that you cannot afford. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, we have to laugh at this because this is a little bit creepy, right? I mean, I mean, Apple is the company that famously is saying... Come on, Christina. Saying, what's, what's not to like? <laughs> 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 Jim, you know as well as I do. I mean, there's Apple is like the company that's making all their that's making huge inroads. Tim Cook is going to these events saying we're the one company who doesn't want to sell your data. But isn't this a little exploitative? And and frankly, isn't this a little elitist? Because frankly, Apple, just because I don't have a lot of money in my bank account today doesn't mean that I'm not getting paid tomorrow and that I don't want to buy those Gucci shoes. I mean, come on. 
there, there is that. It also means that you know, very, very rich people like you, Christina, are going to be seeing ads for Lamborghinis. <laughs> but poor people like me are going to be. We're going to be shown ads for sacks of potatoes and stuff like that. I was um, going to say it's going to be Prime Day all over again in terms of what I get to see. Yes. It's going to be you know the beard growth formula and the snuggies and the shamwells. That's what I'm going to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be weird. The uh, the caveat here, of course, is that uh, Apple files a lot of patents. Um, and the vast majority of its patents never turn into actual real products. And this may be just something they developed, uh, you know, on a whim or as some kind of uh, cul-de-sac of research, just, you know, came up while they were looking at something else. Um, and it, this may, and knowing Apple, probably won't ever happen. But it is very interesting that Apple thinks it can do this if it wants to. So iAd has been a notorious failure. Like iAd has totally just, it hasn't happened. Like, you know, it, it, Apple still technically supports it, but it hasn't really been a big thing. Right. Um, do you think though, I mean, but this honestly seems like as creepy and exploitative and we're making fun of it as it is. If this was something they could actually offer advertisers, this does actually seem like an ad unit that people might want to buy. Um, do, do, do you think that there would be value in this, like from the ad community, from people who are buying ads, that they would actually be interested in taking advantage of this kind of data? Oh, definitely. There's, there's a huge amount of untapped value in Apple's ad network. Advertisers for years have been asking for uh, Apple to pay more attention and give more resources to iAd. iAd is a failure not because uh, there's, there's anything technically wrong with it. iAd is a failure because Apple just doesn't focus on it and doesn't see it as something they want to do in the same way that Google does focus on advertising. Um, and advertisers would love more access to Apple users through their devices via iAd or some other similar system. One thing that springs to my mind is uh, the recent launch of two things. Uh, the new Apple Music app, uh, which obviously is going to create more demand for music and create more purchases through iTunes, which right now is uh, Apple's major e-commerce play, that and the App Store. Um, and then the other thing is uh, Apple has started this Apple News app uh, for publishers, uh, and publishers have lots of traditional advertisers who love to reach people and who love to know what the income or the spending power of those people are. So you can see that uh, an advertising system on Apple devices that knows how much is in your account would be enormously interesting to all sorts of advertisers uh, on the iAd system through Apple Music and through iTunes. Now I'm going to go out on a limb and make a prediction here, and my prediction is that they're going to use this. And where they're going to use it is to advertise the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch is both the cheapest product Apple has ever sold and the most expensive. But you, if you if you advertise the seventeen thousand dollar watch to people who are broke, then you get resentment. Uh, but if you don't advertise the expensive watch, you can't sell it. So I think that they're going to use this for the Apple Watch. I think you're wrong, Mike. Here's, here's why I think you're wrong. Okay. Mike. Because if Apple has to really advertise the Apple Watch then by definition, the Apple Watch is a failure because the Apple Watch is a luxury product and you need to go to it. Like Apple wants right. you to come to its products. It's, a, it's a, like a circle of attraction. And if people don't do that organically, Apple is not going to push it. That would be uh, kind of a little bit humiliating, I think, if Apple felt it had to advertise an $11,000 watch. People are either going to buy it or they're not. Now, how, now, what if you are, what if they, they team it with iBeacons? So you go into one of those luxury retail spots that happens to have the Apple Watch, uh, the gold, the the edition, and you, you go in and you're, you're at this this store in, in France or wherever, and you get a notification on your phone that says, oh, by the way, we have the, the, the Apple Watch edition in stock. Would you like to try one on? That is actually a really excellent idea, and I hadn't thought of that. Apple has been encouraging retailers to use iBeacons all over the place. Apple really wants all of the real bricks and mortar world seeded with iBeacons. And that's because they can uh, get your location down to a couple of feet. Like you, right as you're passing by the shelf in the store, that is when an iBeacon can see you. And that is a good time uh, to serve you an ad. Now, so far, Apple has not used iBeacons for advertising, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, but I, I, I don't think they the have, things... other people have, but yeah, but they could. Right, right. They could, they could. And lots of retailers would absolutely love that. Um, the other thing that they, What's interesting here is that um, Apple is, is building a very large indoor mapping service. Uh, like mm -hmm. it wants maps of, uh, the, of like the insides of shopping malls and large stores like Macy's or uh, Harrods here in London, places like that. Um, and you can see, you can, you can start sort of seeing how all these things fit together 
You know, Apple has about a billion credit cards on file. Apple has great indoor maps of shopping areas. Apple has your location through iBeacons down to a couple of feet. And now Apple has a system for knowing how much is in your bank account and when you might be really, really interested in spending that last couple of dollars on uh, one more song through Apple Music. Well, I think it's interesting that uh, iBeacon is, uh, is a great product and, and Apple is very much behind it. But uh, Google's new Eddystone blows it out of the water as far as I'm concerned. It, it lets you send unique identifiers like uh, iBeacon does. It also lets you send URLs. You can send private or secure uh, beacons just to targeted uh, devices. It's, uh, it seems to be a lot more flexible. Plus, it's uh, open source and cross-platform. So uh, I think it's on now, now that uh, Eddie. Uh, Eddie Stone is out there, but that's a that's a uh, that's a rat hole that we uh, shouldn't go down. So <laughs> Jim Edwards, I want to thank you so much for coming on. You're at uh, Jim is at businessinsider.com and on Twitter at Jim underscore Edwards. Again, Jim, thank you so much for coming on Tech News today. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Well, Apple and Samsung are, believe it or not, trying to work together to render the SIM card obsolete, according to a report by the Financial Times. Instead, the companies want users and carriers to use electronic SIM cards or eSIMs, which would make it much easier for users to switch between carriers. And that's precisely why the carriers aren't going to want this. Christina Warren, will they get away with it? Will Apple and Samsung United make this happen? You know, I think they might be able to. I mean, I think that at this point, you know, the, the SIM is such a technical relic. It, it does not need to exist. And there are so many reasons now. I mean, I think especially as carriers are increasingly, at least in the United States, that's been this uh, this case for a while in other countries, moving away from the subsidy model and moving more to a paying things off either monthly or you buy the, the device up front. Um, I think that, that they are not so much accepting that they're a dumb pipe, but are trying to retain customers in, in, in other ways. So I think working together, they might actually have the ability to do, to do so. I mean, Apple obviously has done this uh, with most carriers, well, with some carriers, with AT&T and, and T-Mobile, and I think Sprint, uh, Verizon's ex ex exempt from this, um, where they have the digital SIM in the uh, iPod, uh, the iPad Air, rather. Uh, so so the iPad has kind of that, that, that electronic SIM. But I think that this would be a great thing, obviously, for users, especially in international markets. And both Apple and Samsung at this point are making phones that have all the radios built in. So it's it's not a case as it used to be where you had like a CDMA version of a phone and a GSM version that worked on certain bands and then a European GSM version that worked on certain bands and then a world mode that maybe had most of those together. At this point, most of the phones are actually you know, they're, they're making maybe a couple of variations, maybe one for parts of Europe or, or, or China um, and parts of Asia, and then one for most of Europe and North America, where it's the same phone and, and the, the bands work regardless of what carrier you're on. So, um, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I hope that they are able to go through with this, but you're right. The carriers are definitely going to react against this by saying, oh, no, 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 no. We need to have this minuscule piece of uh, this, you know, RFID size, size you know, little chip um, inside this so with IMEI number that lets us know what the notification is. And it has to be a physical chip. It can't happen digitally because if that were to happen, then, then you know, chaos would ensue. Yeah, chaos. In other words, uh, consumers would have choice. And that, that's just right. completely unacceptable. Well, in mergers that and acquisitions is. news, Groupon has acquired the food delivery company OrderUp, which uses an Uber-like network of freelance drivers to deliver restaurant food to people's homes and businesses. The six-year-old Baltimore-based OrderUp will continue to exist as a standalone brand. Groupon still has enough money to acquire people? <laughs> Apparently so. They, they, they're using I'm sorry, that was just my, I, that, that's, that's my snarky comment for, comment for the day. We can go on. They gave themselves a Groupon, <laughs> made it cheaper. <laughs> Microsoft announced today that it intends to buy a company called Field One Systems, which makes customer service apps and cloud services for workers in the field. These products uh, do things like automated scheduling, dispatching, work orders, inventory, accessing contracts and other things that people need to do when they're working outside of an office. Well, we got some more news coming right up. But first, I want to talk about Braintree. Braintree is a fantastic way to put payments into your app, into your website. Uh, it's a full stack payment platform that makes it so easy for you. It makes it so easy for your customers. You can accept MasterCard, American Express, Discover, Diners Club, PayPal, Apple Pay, Venmo, Visa. You can even accept Bitcoin. If you're a mobile app developer, you got to check out Braintree. Uh, it's, so, it's the solution used by Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Hotel Tonight, Living Social, and Munchery. Uh, Braintree offers a JavaScript library for mobile and desktop or web uh, applications. So easy. You can implement this in about a half an hour. Uh, it's, it's very easy for you, and you don't have to go around 
individually dealing with all these different payment providers. They'll do it for you. You just uh, build that code into your solution and off you go, able to accept payments as easy as Uber can. Uber didn't become the giant company that it is today by having a difficult to use uh, payment system. They did it by using Braintree. No minimum or monthly fees, no red tape. You only pay for the transactions that you process and you can accept more than 130 currencies. Braintree gives you a full stack payment solution support for all payment types that your customers might want. Start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, and, and a lot more with a single integration across all platforms. They also have superior fraud protection, great customer service, and super fast payouts. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. Well, Google announced second quarter earnings yesterday, and the company beat expectations, and I expected them to beat expectations. I don't know mm -hmm. where that leaves it. The, the uh, call also served as a public debut of Google's new chief finance, financial officer, Ruth Porat. The company announced profits of nearly $4 billion for the quarter on revenue of $17.7 billion. That's an 11% increase over the second quarter of last year. And despite all that cash, Google also announced new controls on spending. You know, Christina Warren, I detected controls on spending at Google I.O. They were being uh, kind of cheaper than they normally are. Normally, they're, they're just like dropping yeah. $100 bills from helicopters and stuff like that. This year, they, you know, the food was worse. They didn't have great giveaways. They're giving away everything. Well, I was going to say, they didn't, have, they didn't give anybody a free Nexus 6 or new tablets or anything. Yeah, it's like, okay, great. I got, uh, I got cardboard. It was, it was awesome, though, coming out of the keynote. People were scratching their heads having the first worldest problem you could possibly imagine. Right. They were saying, oh, we didn't what? get a Chromebook get a Pixel. Device. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's so unfair. Oh, no, that's right. That's right. Well, no, but I mean, and honestly, giving people a Chromebook Pixel is a little excessive, Google. You didn't need to do that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it makes sense. I mean, they've made some big acquisitions, and, and obviously the revenue is continuing to, to rise. But, I mean, it makes sense if spending is going up that much. Maybe, maybe you know, control it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the combination of such a stellar uh, quarter that beat expectations and also an announcement that they're going to control spending – just made their stock just shoot through the roof. They actually added uh, so much valuation that the amount of additional valuation in that one day yesterday was more than the value of U Uber. So uh, it was a huge, huge jump. Well, we've got some big numbers for you, a couple of big numbers. One is 398. That's how many products Amazon says were ordered on average every second of its 24-hour yep. Amazon Prime Day promotion. The event was a big hit despite criticism, according to the company. Amazon said they sold far more products than they did on any previous Black Friday, and they got more people to try Amazon Prime than any single day in the company's history. They also unloaded a lot of their own products, including tens of thousands of Fire TV sticks in a single hour. Uh, Christina Warren, they don't care about criticism. They're raking in the dough, no, they so that's don't. good enough. They are raking it in. They're laughing all the way to the bank. I, I got a pair of headphones. I got some uh, some, some Blu-rays. Um, yes, I, I still buy physical media, um, even though I, I usually just wind up finding ways to download said digital uh, physical media digitally or, or I rip it. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I mean, they laughed all the way to the bank. What was interesting, I thought, was that uh, iRobot makes the Roomba. They sold one Wow. Uh, the, the the vacuum cleaners they sold the, the, the previous week, the previous Wednesday, they'd sold one or, or the previous day. They sold 14,000. Wow. <laughs> on Prime Day. And Bose had sold uh, eight pairs of headphones the, the previous Wednesday, and they sold 41,000 wow. on Prime Day. Now, so 51,000. There you go. 51,000 compared to eight the previous Wednesday, um, 14,000 iRobot Roombas compared to one last week. So that's insanity. Did, did, did the knowledge that the, that the day was coming uh, cause the, the sales to drop in advance of the, of the Amazon Prime Day? Uh, I don't think so, because I don't think people knew that anything, I mean, at, at least not not in terms of some of the products that were on sale, because they didn't really do, um, I mean, they, I think we all assumed, they, they started leaking what deals were going to be the night before. They, you know, they, they told us that the Echo was going to be $50 off, and they, they announced that there would be deals on the Fire TV stick and on some of the Kindles, and that there would be a $115 TV, they didn't tell us the brand, and a, and a $79 TV. But I, I don't think so, and I think that, you know, the, the, the range of products that was on sale was... Um, 
widened up. I mean, a lot of people uh, fairly cr kind of classified it as, you know, Amazon's garage sale, getting rid of stuff, you know, um, keeping um, their warehouses full. But I think that ultimately at the end of the day, that didn't matter because they did a really good job promoting Prime Day. There were tons of TV ads, um, tons of internet ads, um, and, uh, and people came out in droves. So I think that uh, it was kind of the perfect internet story. People love to save money, people love gadgets, and people love to complain. So uh, it, it, it was a huge win for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Best Buy is going to have something called a uh, Black Friday in July sale next Friday, I believe. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, if they no, do as I mean, well. I, I, that. That's what's really interesting about this is obviously um, Walmart was very quick to respond and had kind of a whole week of sales. And, and some people were saying, oh, they kind of won the day, although I think Amazon sucked most of the oxygen out of the, uh, out of the room. But what's interesting about this is that there used to be the Christmas in July sales that you used to see, especially amongst um, more traditional retailers, your Macy's and your Riches and your, you know, um, uh, uh, um, you know, other types of department stores, but we haven't had that in a while. And I, it, it's interesting that, that Amazon brought back what was this very old kind of retail philosophy of having the mid-year sale. Um, I, I kind of love that. Yeah, it's, it, it is amazing. And it's, it's, I think it's also hilarious that they got so much bad. We talked about it yesterday on the show about how many people were complaining and whining. Different companies did studies. Uh, even even uh, Adobe did a study that, that said that, there were, you know, that comments about Amazon Prime Day were more associated with sadness than happiness and right. things like that. It was pretty hilarious. But, again, they don't care. They, they raked in a lot no, of money. No, they, they laughed all the way to the bank. They're like, complain away. And that's the funny thing. You, you talk to most people who complain and you say, okay, well, did you buy anything? Well, well yeah, I mean, I bought – and yeah. you're like, so they won. And I signed up for Amazon Prime in order to buy it too. So, yeah, it, it, <laughs> I didn't. I was already a Prime member, but still. Yeah, you were already a Prime member. I was going to say, dude, you were already in the club. Yeah, you already I, knew the benefits. Of yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we got another big number for you. $500 million. That's how many dollars Netflix, HBO, and other internet video subscription providers are losing as a result of subscribers sharing their passwords with non-subscribers, according to a recent report from Parks Associates. Christina Warren, this is what the report said, but I think it's a bunch of BS yeah. because it's based on the assumption. Yeah, it's based on the assumption that if people didn't st use a, somebody else's password that they would pay the money, Praise. which they wouldn't. The Praise. alternative is to not Praise. download it or something. Exactly. Exactly. No, I, I'm, 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 I'm like putting up my praise hands emoji for, for World Emoji Day because you're exactly right. When I read this study, I rolled my eyes and I went, no, this is a theoretical amount of money they could have potentially in a, in a universe that is not real capture. This is not money they're losing because most of the people, I would venture to say, the alternative between paying the money for HBO Go or for, you know, um, Hulu or, or for even for, for Amazon, although most people don't share their Amazon um, uh, login IDs because it is your Amazon login ID so people can actually order stuff. That's one of Amazon's smart things. Um, you know, Netflix, others, um, is that, you know, uh, you it would be that they would subscribe to these services anyway. They wouldn't. Most people would not. And I think this is why HBO CEO has gone on record many times in the past and saying they're not that concerned about people sharing HBO Go or HBO Now logins because they understand that there might be some people who, if given the chance, they really need to see Game of Thrones, they'll subscribe. But there are a lot more people who just wouldn't watch. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, or, or they would find another way. They would go over to someone's house. You know, there there are a million loopholes. And so, yeah, I have a lot of problems with this study because it's based on the assumption uh, that all those people would actually be buying customers, if not for the ability to um, share passwords. And that's just not true. Yeah, and this comes right out of the Motion Picture Association of America playbook, which always uh, emphasized yeah. how much money they're losing based on the that same assumption, even though it's BS. What really happens is that when people are younger, they will, instead of, you know, they, they're essentially giving themselves a freemium model. They try something using somebody else's password. And at some point, you know, people grow up, they, you know, they end up, they get married or whatever. And at some point it just becomes distasteful to do that or inconvenient right. or whatever. And they, they start totally. paying for it because they're already addicted. So they're already addicted. I mean, and I mean, I think HBO has even seen this to a certain extent where I've talked to a number of my friends who for years have been sharing HBO Go passwords or, or cable logins with people. Um, and some of them disclosure, I've given them my HBO Go, my cable login information so they could log in and watch it. What is that login again, Christine? Now, what, what is the login? <laughs> I'll, I'll email it to you. Okay, I'll email thanks. it to you. Um, and, and now that, you know, HBO Now is an option, now that they can actually subscribe without having to have the cable package, a lot of them are just doing that because they would rather have access to their 
their own and have their own watch list, not have to deal with the fact that, you know, I have huge watch lists for when I want a marathon um, through old seasons of Oz. Um, and, and, and they're like, what are you doing? You know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a, a certain argument to be made that in some cases, not all, and I'm certainly not trying to make the argument that this is a great lead generation tool because that's not what I'm saying. But I do think that it is notable and should be pointed out that in some cases, having access to these services before you buy them is the thing that will get a person, maybe not now, but maybe in a few years or a few months or what, or down the line, um, interested in actually paying for your service. Yeah, I think to a certain extent, borrowing somebody else's password is an indication you're not willing to pay for it. I mean, so if you know yeah. if people were going to pay for it, they'd pay for it. All right, well, in news you can lose, let's face it. People exaggerate on social media and present a much better version of their lives than the actual reality mm -hmm. of their lives. Now, a video maker named Casey Neistat has come out with a social network called Beam, B-E-M-E, -E, which exists mm -hmm. to present the truth on social media. The app uses an iPhone's proximity sensor, yeah, it's iOS only, as the, re as the record button. By covering the sensor, by holding it up against your chest or just by putting your hand over it, a four-second clip is recorded and instantly uploaded with no option to edit. Let's check out the video. Can of Play-Doh. So why Beam? You see, social media, it's supposed to be a digital or virtual version of who we are as people. Mm, Instead, really. it's this highly yeah, sculpted, calculated, calibrated version of who we are. That's Told true. through filters that make our eyes yes. bluer and carefully selected images to portray a version of who we are. It doesn't really resemble the reality of things. Who wants reality? My team and I, Seriously. we spent the last year plus building a new version of social, a new way to share, one that we it's feel Snapchat bridges that uncanny yeah. you, valley. You can't Real life use an here. app to regulate this behavior. Here, People will still use the here. app. They'll wait mean. until they're, yeah, you know, doing something you awesome. You a perfect place. Yeah. The video, you go like this. And frankly, who wants to see boring stuff? I, I wanted to see reality, I would go outside. Eyes, I wouldn't be on my phone. Although, you know, The Sims now has a, uh, like this, we talked about it yesterday after the show, The Sims has a sure spa a day, way. or, you know, there's there's there are a lot of games where you actually spend time doing dishes and stuff like that, which I don't understand. Which is so fun. No, I play uh, I play different, I, I have this game called Shave Me, which is for iPad, which will like let you shave someone's beard. It's the most bizarre thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, wow. But yeah, there there are, there are apps that will like they're like well, there's a Simpsons episode where they they're doing the the housework simulator and how, talk about how much fun it is when they're at the science museum. Uh, when just hours earlier, Marge had asked them to do housework and they had, they, had, they had refused. Yeah, and 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 speaking of the the Sims thing, it's, I mean one of the funniest uh, ironies about that is you're si you're sitting there in a dark room, slouched <laughs> over your <laughs> desk, watching people do yoga. You know, it's like yeah, <laughs> it doesn't oh, help completely, you completely, completely. Do, do, doing the dishes, you know, doing other stuff. No, I mean, look, we all want a little escape, even if that escape is in, you know, the, the doldrums of daily life. Uh, I think it should be pointed out. I mean, I think Beam, I think it's funny. It is kind of a, a Snapchat uh, meets, you know, uh, Vine sort of thing. Yeah. But, you know, KC is really well known for making really provocative viral videos that, if we're being honest, don't always portray reality. They're done in such a way to go viral and get attention because he's a very good filmmaker. But I think it's a little bit... Uh, rich for him to be, you know, calling out uh, the uh, insincerity of social media um, when, uh, you know, he's he's the guy who made who became famous by creating a video about um, the iPod uh, battery always dying when a new one came out and, and, and was this or was this not some vast, you know, humongous conspiracy. Yeah, it's designed to to go viral and get attention, just like this app is designed to do. Yep. Well, our TNT fan of the day and, is... And we're fine to it. So go him. Yeah, exactly. Our TNT fan of the day is Terrence Blunt in Atlanta, Georgia, who posted this picture on both Google Plus and Twitter. He can watch the video in his car while driving, but instead he plays only the audio version of Tech News Today, and he says he loves the show. We appreciate that. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT. And what? And Beam. And Beam. Post it on Beam. Uh, post the real thing on Beam, not the not the uh, artificially wonderful <laughs> version of you watching TNT, and uh, use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Christina Warren, how was uh, how was Taylor Swift? 
Uh, Taylor Swift was amazing. One of the best concerts I've ever been to. Uh, it was fantastic. So anybody, if she's coming to your city or, or city near you, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic two hours plus of just pop madness. Fantastic stuff. Pop madness. And, and what are you working on these days? Are you uh, working on any big stories? Well, we are uh, covering the, the Tesla news as that comes out. So that press conference, I think, just started. So I'm going to be editing some people's stories as that happens. And uh, that, that starts in just a couple of moments. And I'm reviewing the new iPod Touch because that just got an update. After three plus, oh, like almost three years of, of without updates, we all thought it was dead. It is not. Um, so my review for that should be ready for early next week. It's like the perfect smartphone. It's a, it's a smartphone that can't make calls and can't receive calls. That's the best part. That, that, that's the best part. You it can't receive calls. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Christina Warren as film underscore girl on Twitter. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. See you next week, Mike. Right, bye bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today or you can get the audio version, the small, medium or super high def version delivered right to your phone, tablet or PC. Got to check out all the options at twit.tv slash TNT. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, we'd appreciate that. Here's how you do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on the social media side of your choice. Tag three friends and tell them to subscribe for crying out loud. Follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV and you can follow me and also read my stuff at elgin.com. And don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Tony, Tony Wang. Tony, I don't know who Tony Wang is. Tony Wang. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you Monday.